If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let me just say a, a word of encouragement. Um, don't ever make the poor decision and say, well, it's communion day. So I don't need to be as zealous about making sure I get to church. Or it's easier to say, hey, I'll miss out on communion day because it's just communion day. And how many communion days have I done in my life? Well, if that's your attitude, then you won't be coming to take communion in a way that's worthy of the Lord. So maybe you should miss it. The communion day is a very special day. It's a reminder because we as humans need reminders of what Christ did. And therefore, what should be important to us? What should be what motivates us to get out of bed? And all these different things. Communion reminds me, Tab, these other things aren't important. Jesus is important. Tab, this is why Paul says, this one thing I do. Press on for the Lord. And you're not doing that one thing. You need this shot in the arm saying, hey, red flag. You need to come back and get your priorities straight. Meaning, you need to repent of what you've made a priority that shouldn't be a priority, and therefore you made Jesus, who should be the priority, not the priority. Amen? Now, I believe every one of you have this quote that I couldn't find the author of, this quote in your outline. To mistreat a brother or a sister, to mistreat a brother is to show contempt against Christ's death. It goes on to say, talking about mistreating your brother or sister, it hurts the gospel message. It hurts the witness of the gospel message. And it brings contempt or attempts the judgment of God. We need to make sure before we do communion, and we need to make sure before we do anything, that we're right with each other. Amen? That we ain't sinned against each other. Now let me say this, because I have encountered this in other, in other church, that someone got very upset with me. And I could, I mean, extremely upset with me. Quit coming to my service. And all these kind of things. And I, I prayed, and I said, God, what have I done? And I tried to talk to the person, wouldn't talk to me. Say all these, and they said all these terrible things about me. Finally, I got them in my office. And I said, please, show me what sin I've done. I prayed. I've asked God. Well, I don't know anything I've done. I'm not trying to be prideful, but I really need to know what sin I've done. And then they began to get, get it off their chest. And as I listened to this get off their chest, I realized I hadn't sinned against them. I just hadn't done it what they, the way they wanted me to do it. Now, just because we need to make sure that we define sin when we're wrong with someone's wrong, it's because the Bible says don't do this, and they did what the Bible says don't do. It's not because they didn't do my preference. It's because they violated God's Word and it affected me. Does that make sense? And I did. I said, please forgive me. But thank goodness, I burned them. I didn't sin against you. But please forgive me for unintentionally hurting your feelings. And I was sincere about that. But make sure that when your brother has, you think your brother has something against you, that you can go in the Word of God and say, you know, they lied about me. Or they slandered me, or they whatever the Bible says. And then you need to go to that one. But don't go to that one if they hadn't sinned against you. Go to that one, if the Bible says, if they've sinned against you. And get that right with them, and already forgive them. If we sin against the body, meaning the church, our brothers and sisters, what a terrible witness that is to a lost world. Let me ask you this question. Are you right with your brothers and sisters? We're going to look at this text, and I don't want to give it away right now, but we're going to see that really the particular sin Paul's talking about, any sin puts us to take communion in an unworthy manner. But particularly the sin Paul's referring to in this context is sinning against your brother, sinning against your sister. Because that is what hurts the body of the Lord. By the way, I, my biased opinion, I think Candace is awesome. But you know what? I don't get to enjoy how awesome and great she is if I've sinned against her. 
Right? I don't. I mean, she's still the same person. She has the same character. She's still my wife, still the mother of my children. She still does and deals with a lot of things and does it well. But if I'm wrong with her and I ain't got it right with her, I don't enjoy her as much. Is it because of her? No, it's because of me. And see, and the same thing is true with God. God's always awesome. God's always perfect. God's always full of abundance of joy, peace, and fulfillment. But you know what? If I've sinned against God, I don't enjoy God as much, do I? I don't enjoy the peace. I don't enjoy the fulfillment that God has. God had not changed, has He? No, Tab put, chose to put sin and broke fellowship with God. So I have to repent and be sincere. Say, God, forgive me of whatever this sin is so I can go back and enjoy God in the fullness of who He is. Does that make sense? A communion is a reminder. Hey, get right with God if you're not right with God. Because you're not enjoying all that God has for you until you get right with Him. And, and as we're going to talk about today, because that's what this text talks about, especially in the area of not being right with your brother and sister. Listen, if you have sinned against your brother and sister and have not gotten that right with them, you're not, not, not only you're not right with them, you're not right with God. Because if I'm not right with somebody here, I can't be right with some, the God Almighty. Amen. So let's look at verse 27. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 11 says this. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, as we said, I'm going to say again, any sin is violates us from having communion in a way that's honoring to the Lord, that's worthy. But particular here, because Paul uh, over and over again refers to us as brothers. So he's that family, and we're part of the family of God. And by, Paul speaks here in verse 27. He says, Therefore whoever eats or drinks uh, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of what? The body. Who's the body? We're the body. We're the body of Christ. And so what Paul says here in verse 27, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord if they eat or drink of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Listen, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is to proclaim Christ. That is the purpose. And if I'm not right with the Lord, then I'm not proclaiming Christ and what all He's done in my life and the power of God. If I can't get right with Donald, because what Donald's done is so bad to me, I can't forgive Donald, then how does that me participate in proclaiming the greatness of God? If I can't get forgive Donald. Or I can't go to Donald and say, Brother, you've sinned against me, I forgive you, but I want to point it out to you. So we can go back and have fellowship. How is that proclaiming the power of the gospel working through my life? How is that me proclaiming to my own family, my church family, that I'm a new creation of Christ, that He's a big God? Well, listen, you know, you go around saying He's a big God. Do you know how you convince people it's a big God? Your life. Your life convinces lost people how big God really is. And if you're not forgiving this person, got a grudge here, you're being passive aggressive this one here, your, your communication of how big God is, is really small. How powerful He is must not be real powerful. Because you can't even get along with your family. You're treating your family, who y'all confess to be changed by the resurrection of Jesus, the same way the lost Johnsons over here treat each other. That's a poor witness of the gospel message, amen? And Paul says here, that is taking the communion, the Lord's Supper, in an unworthy manner. Why is it unworthy? Because it's sinning against the body of Christ. Are you, let me ask you a question. According to the Word of God. By the way, none of us struggle what this is, do we? We're all in agreement what this is, right? 
So according to what we all agree, this is God's words, God's thoughts recorded on paper, or would you be qualified to take communion today? Or would you be guilty if you took communion of taking it in a way that's unworthy, sinning, being guilty of sinning against the body? The whose body? The body of Christ. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse uh, 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equally with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of the man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death, even death on the cross. You don't see any sense, you can't even pick up any sniff of, 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 of entitlement attitude. It was always dying to self. So that if dying, if dying to me dying, me suffering, would benefit others, then that's what I do. You don't see where Jesus is out with somebody. And Jesus was spit upon. Jesus gave up being face to face with the Father. He gave up a sinless environment to come to a sinful world. You don't see Jesus going around saying... Well, now, so-and-so did me wrong, and none of us, all of us actually, put together, has never been come close to be done wrong as Christ was done wrong. See, what, what did Jesus do? Jesus never made the gospel message look weak. He never made his father look small. He never hurt the witness because he never sinned against the body. Tell you a story I think I've told you before about a church, very large church. We call this church a mega church. Have a lot of ordained staff on the church. Had a very wise senior pastor. And you know, when you get young guys on your staff, a lot of times they for different reasons, they don't always seem to get along so well. And it's, the pastor has dealt with this before, but he had these two guys that really seemed to have a problem with each other. And he tried to talk to them, and then he, together he tried to talk to them one on one, and nothing really seemed to improve the situation. So finally, the, the wise pastor called them both in his office. And he said, Fellas, I have talked to y'all, and y'all tell me there's nothing between y'all, but it just doesn't seem that way to me. And he said, For no other reason, I'm going to present something to you just for my own peace of mind. And I have everything we need here to do it right here in my office. But if there's really nothing between y'all, now I want you to think about you and your relationship. If there's, he says, really nothing between y'all, I want to ask you, now your job's not on the line, but I want to ask you, would you be willing to wash each other's feet? What an expression of humility what he's asking. Would you deny yourself to serve? Because you know in the Jewish Household, the foot washer was the lowest servant. Of all servants, they were the lowest servant. And he asked these two ordained ministers, would you, if nothing else, for my peace of mind, would you be willing to serve each other? Basically, he said, wash each other's feet. And one said, absolutely I would. Now you'd have to assume that that expressed what, what was true of his heart. He really wanted to do that. He wouldn't do that, just try to please his senior pastor. But that's really what he wanted to do. But the other one, and you have to at least say, th he was honest. He said, no, I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. See, if he couldn't take communion in a, in a worthy manner. He would be sinning against the body. And he could probably pull off Sunday school better than any of us. You know, how to look, how to act, say the right things, look the right way. And yet there was a sin there, wasn't there? And like I said a minute ago, if you're not right here, you're not right here.
Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with all humility of mind, let each you regard one another as how? More important than yourself. Verse 27 again says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, what is that? Shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let's look at verse 28 and 29. But let a man examine himself. Do spiritual inventory. God, how are we doing? God, how is my relationships? Examine himself. And so, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. To avoid a sinning against the body. Let it, Paul says here in verse 28, we ought to examine ourselves. Examine what? Examine our actions. Examine our motives. Examine our attitudes. And to what degree do I examine it? Do I need to, to the degree that is my actions, my motives, my attitudes, are they at the same level as the purpose of communion? Communion is to proclaim the power of God. Is my action proclaiming the power of God? Is my motives proclaiming the power of God? Is my attitude proclaiming the power of God? To me, one of the best texts in the Bible about the application, about how's my motives, how's my actions, how's my attitude, is found in the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 4. This tells me a lot about my actions, my motives, and attitude. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not, here's one, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I'm out with Donald. Boy, I'm so glad he's having a hard time at work. Makes me feel a little better because I don't like him. But I can't communicate that because I won't, I won't look spiritual. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love, verse 7, love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. Love never fails. Are you a candidate for communion based on the Word of God? The Lord's Supper is a praise, but until I'm right with God, I can't praise Him. Because I don't apathy keeps me from enjoying the awesomeness of God. Right? He's awesome all the time, but I don't enjoy it if I let apathy sneak in. Or any other sin. Sin hinders my focus. It hinders my passion for Him. And that's why you can see Christians making decisions that you know aren't godly. That not, they, they'll make decisions. They'll quit going to church. Or they'll quit serving. Or they'll quit this. Or they'll start saying it's unfair about this. Didn't it say love doesn't keep an account? Of wrong suffer. Do you know what? You, you know if Christ Jesus kept an account just on my life, he wouldn't have went to the cross. He's gonna he just said, Tab, two thousand years from you're gonna be born and you're gonna you're gonna do me wrong, you're gonna sin against me over and over and over and over and over again. You're gonna go to hell, Tab. And you deserve to go to hell. And you know what? I can't defend that. All I can say is, Jesus, help. Because I'm guilty. I'm going to go to hell. And Jesus says, guess what you deserve? But I, and that payment has to be paid. 
Because your sin, there's a debt to have, and that debt has to be... Didn't, didn't Romans chapter 6, verse 23 say, the wages is a wage. The wages of sin is what? Death. That wage has to be paid to have your wage, your debt. But it goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life. He said, by love, Tab, I step in your place. I paid that bill. A bill you can't pay. You owe, but you can't pay. And if nothing else gets you fired up, if that can't get you fired up, then I don't think it's possible for you to get fired up. To want to go deeper with God. To pursue the things of God. To die to little gods and put Him back on the altar of your life. Amen? So how's your actions? How's your motive? How's your attitude? Does it represent the power of God? Or does it look like your God must be different my God because your God is smaller than my God because you look like the lost souls family over there. He's a big God, folks. And when He comes in, here's what the problem is in the American churches. When really the Bible teaches, when God comes in, He takes over. You look different. And over time, you look more different. Your desires change. Amen? He doesn't share room. He's not looking for a roommate. Amen? So are you a candidate today for communion? Or are you a candidate for the altar? To get right before you touch communion. Now let's go down to verse 30. Verse 30 through 32 is very interesting and a little bit controversial. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30. For this reason many among you are weak and sick and a number are asleep. But if, verse 31 gives you a little uh, commentary on 30, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we shall not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned, condemned excuse me, along with the world. Now verse 30 says there, many are asleep. You know what that means? Death. He also says in verse 30, many are weak, many are sick. Why are they weak? How do they get sick? Why are some asleep, dead? Why is, how, how did that happen? Sin. Sin. Now, not everyone who sin dies. I mean, eventually, the, re, the, the, the reason we die is because of sin. We live in a sinful world. But there's some sins that lead to death. There, do you know that sin actually affects your health? Do you know one of the reasons, one of the benefits of me getting right with God, it makes me, it improves my health. When I'm walking with the Lord, I'm not worrying. When I'm walking with the Lord, and you know what, all the, well, I don't want to say something. I know somebody will say something, and there's probably exceptions to the rule. But as a rule, if you walk with the Lord, you probably won't take as much medicine. Especially certain kinds of medicines. About anxiety, a different thing. Because the Lord is God Almighty. Amen? Now, there's much more I could say, but I'm not going to say it right now. But, don't, but when a doctor or especially a school person tries to tell me what no one needs, I know who's Almighty. Just a little food for thought. And I know who I'm going to answer to one day for that little boy. And I know who's, who created that little boy. And I know who's in charge of that little boy. And sin makes us sick. Sin makes us weak. And sin kills, it brings many asleep, many dead. Folks, sin, God sees very seriously. So seriously that we're heading to hell and the only life jacket He can throw out there to keep us from going to hell is send His Son to die for us. Amen? 
So we don't, and listen, I'm talking to people I love to death. We don't need to take communion and, and if we got sin in our life, if we're not right with our brothers and sisters, because it, it sins against the body. What you need to do with that sin is run to the altar and say, God, forgive me of that. Because I don't want to be in bondage anymore. I don't want to be weak anymore. And we've got a lot of weak, puny Christians walking around. How do you know they're weak and puny? Because when it's time to stand for God, and it might cost them a little, a little bit on the paycheck, I ain't saying, I ain't touching that. I ain't touching that. Amen? I'm not going to take a stand there. And you know what's so bad about it? They won't take a stand, and they got other Christian friends here not going to take a stand, so they make a little group, and they say, I agree with you. Yeah, I wouldn't either. All right, good deal. And they kind of give each other shots in the arm about not taking a stand for God. That wasn't Paul. That wasn't Peter after Pentecost. Peter was weak when it was time for Jesus to go to the cross. But after God restored him in Pentecost, Peter wasn't the same Peter. And by the way, if you met Jesus, you shouldn't be the same person you used to be. Amen? God takes sin very seriously. Lastly, very quickly, then we're going to have an altar call. Let's look at verse 33 and part of verse 34. Of 1 Corinthians 11. So then, Paul says, my brother, there's brethren again, family. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you may not come together for judgment. Paul says there in verse 33, wait for one another. You know what's going on? See, when they did communion so much different than we did, they had a feast. And at the end, the climax of the feast, they did the Lord's Supper. We do the Lord's Supper, and we get a little, a little bread, a little juice, at the end of a message. And then we go eat lunch. Well, that's not how they did it. And, but now this feast they had, they only, let, they, they, they only let the rich people, the influential people, come first and participate in the meal. And what was left over, if, you know, if, if Jim's had enough to eat, and there's some left over, then we, the rest of us could have some. And what is that? That's the sin of, of favoritism. That's the sin of the world. Choosing some over the others. And the Bible clearly says over and over again, there's no favoritism with the heart of God. That is a witness to lost people. Hey, your God's not real big. Hey, the power of God must not be that powerful. Because you're treating your brothers like the lost people treat their family. How they treat everybody. Those who are influential gets more. They get to go first. And that's why Paul is saying here, hey, if you're hungry, eat at the house before you come. It's not about the meal. Let everybody come at the same time. If you do, do it rightly, don't do it in a way that's unrighteous. Treat everybody the same. By the way, does not the Bible teach that the good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and go after how many sheep? Just one? Well, that goes totally against what the world teaches me to do. The world says, get the majority. Some will slip through the crack, but get the majority. The Bible teaches that the good shepherd's excited, much excited, and cares just as much as that one, as much as he does the 99 over here. No favoritism and how you treat each other. Amen? You don't say, hey, Jim, how you doing? Good deal, good deal. Hey, Robert. I spoke to her. I don't like him, though. I spoke to her. Oh, I didn't say that. Oh, I miss. Oh, I, 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 I want to see spiritual. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Exam in our heart. Our motive, our actions, our attitudes. Let's go back to verse 27 very quickly, then we're going to have an altar call. Now, by the grace of God, we have an opportunity to respond correctly to the Word of God now. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an un 
worthy manner. What happens to them, Lord? They shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let each man examine himself. Verse 31. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we shall not be what? Judged. Verse 32. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. You know the whole purpose of communion is? Two things, equally important. Causing me to look back what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Also to look back what He did when I met Him. Amen? You might have been five when you met him. You might have been 50 when you met him. But it caused you to look back 2,000 years ago and whenever that was, you met him if you've ever met him. But just as much on the other side of that coin, communion calls me to look forward. Because see, my walk with God, as long as I've had a walk with God, has been pretty good, pretty sweet. He's always been there. I've, I know what peace feels like. I know what joy feels like. I know what fulfillment feels like. I know what the gifts of God feels like when He's blessed my life. And what I know and what I've experienced is just the tip of the iceberg and for what it'll be when I go home. Amen? So it calls me to look back with gratitude saying, Jesus, I don't understand how you can love a sinner like me that much, but thank you, God, for the grace of God I'm saved through faith. Not by words, because if it was by my words, I'm still going to hell. I, my words wouldn't even slow down the pace of me going to hell. But thank you, Lord Jesus, but by your grace I'm saved. I met you at the young man. I denied you over and over again, but you never gave up on me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And God, I'm so grateful for the time I've walked with you. It gets me excited about the next 10 years and 20 years if I'm still on this earth 20 years from now. Because I've, what I've experienced is I've walked with you. But God, that is nothing because I know enough of the Word of God and I know enough of your character. That is nothing about what I'll experience when I go home. Amen? But see, folks, I don't have that attitude. I mean, all that's still just as true. But I don't have that attitude. I don't have that zeal. I don't have that enthusiasm if I'm not right with my brother. Because I've allowed sin to, to water down the enthusiasm, the thankfulness of all that God has done and will continue to do in my life. Amen? Don't sin against the body. Examine yourself rightly. Are you a candidate for communion? Or are you first a candidate for the altar? 